me just do this small introduction here. Yeah, so I'm mainly working as a senior developer advocate at Quadrant, and we are also building another open source vector database. Uh, we focus a lot about performance and try to make it as, as fast as possible, incorporating some different search modes. Uh, I'm not going to get much into details because I've uh, noticed that many of you already used some sort of vector databases, uh, which are ultimately rather search engines instead, but it doesn't matter a lot, but since you are somehow experienced with using uh, vector databases, I also think that you know the concept of the text embedding models. Uh, but as a regular user, you may never really, really thought about what are the internals and what is actually the process that happens uh, under the hood when you just pass uh, textual input. Uh, but back in the days, text embedding models were rather a niche that was used by some information, uh, information retrieval uh, engineers to improve uh, the effectiveness of their search pipelines. Uh, it has changed a lot when OpenAI introduced ChatGPT and when we realized that it might be actually pretty useful to use them to, to add this semantic search layer to reduce the risk of hallucinating for those models and actually to incorporate your own private data so the large language model can rely on it instead of just using the training data uh, that it has seen uh, in its training phase. Um, and as I said, a regular user rarely care, cares about uh, the way their embeddings are created. This is, however, quite useful if you really care about uh, the quality, because if you don't understand the process, you can never really improve it at all. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, the idea behind the embedding models is that given a specific uh, text, uh, it will produce a single vector. So traditional check using would be hopefully represented uh, by a single vector. And the most useful property of these vectors is that if you have two different texts that represent uh, similar idea or concept, uh, they should be close to each other in that semantic space. So Beprock Ned Lozello, I guess we cannot go more closer to, to traditional check using than this. Uh, should have a re similar representation. If you just see at the individual dimensions here, you should see that they're like close to each other. They are never identical, but still, if we calculate the cosine similarity or a different metric, the similarities should be pretty high because they actually represent something that is similar in the real world. Um, and majority of the embedding models, actually all of the ones that we used, uh, we use nowadays are based on transformer model. Uh, this diagram is probably the most popular diagram that you have seen in so many presentations that I'm not just going to get uh, into details, but it comes from the attention is all you need paper. And it presents like a general overview of the transformer architecture, but in case of the embedding models, we do not care that much about the right hand side of that picture because uh, the embedding models are usually encoder-only uh, architectures. Um, they do not predict any kind of output probabilities, so they do not predict the next token in a sequence, contrary to what LLMs uh, do, uh, but they just take some input and produce vectors, uh, which have these useful properties of, uh, of uh, being uh, similar to each other. And if we uh, have a closer look at the left-hand side of this uh, whole diagram, we can clearly see that everything starts from, uh, from the inputs, which are not well-defined here. Uh, then those inputs are converted into input embeddings, uh, enriched with positional encodings, and then processed by N stacked modules armed with attention mechanism. Uh, this is a very generic overview, uh, and uh, it doesn't say much about how the inputs or outputs look like. Um, however, if we consider some examples, you should gather some, some sort of intuition on how things uh, work under the hood. Um, so in order to visualize that a little bit more, I selected one of the available sentence transformers. Uh, all mini LM L6 V2 has been actually mentioned today already uh, in one of the previous talks. And that's not the best embedding model available out there, but 
it's quite commonly used for multiple reasons, mainly because it's uh, quite small and might be launched even on a, a CPU. So even for those who are still GPU poor, like me, this is a fairly uh, reasonable choice. And also this is an open source uh, tool so you can easily see all the steps and hopefully uh, improve, uh, improve it, fine tune it on your own data. Uh, it also has a reasonably small amount of parameters. That's also why, why it is so small, because it requires around 30 megabytes of memory, which is enormously small uh, if you compare it even to the smallest LLM available. And it works surprisingly well for English data. Mm, and today I'm just going to dive into the internals of it. So one thing that this transformer diagram didn't mention is actually the tokenizer which is rather a separate component, separate from the transformer itself. And the, tra the, co the tokenizer defines some sort of contract between the input data and, uh, and the model itself. Uh, and in case of text, the tokenizer resp is responsible for cutting the, uh, a long sequence of words into pieces. Um, so these unclear inputs of the model are not like whole texts, because th those are not end-to-end -end models, uh, but rather sequences of our identifiers, uh, our tokenizer assigned to each token in that uh, original data. Mm, and it's still unclear how this tokenization works, because there is no single algorithm available out there. Uh, the tokenizer could possibly split our string into, set into uh, individual letters, and there are some attempts to do that. Um, on the other hand, we could possibly split the text into just into words, uh, but the usual choice for the tokenizer is some sort of sub-word level tokenization and algorithms such as uh, byte per encoding, word piece, or unigram are quite commonly used for that. And the main, uh, the main idea behind all of these algorithms is that those are also trainable components. So if you are about to train your own transformer for, for the text embeddings, but also an LLM, you should also train your own tokenizer. And contrary to uh, the transformer models, the tokenizer is not based on any kind of stochastic uh, method. It's rather uh, some sort of statistics over the training data. So, so the tokenizer just selects the best subword uh, tokens with a fixed vocabulary size. So we, let's say we expect the tokenizer to, to, to produce a vocabulary of, uh, with 30,000 uh, tokens, and that's actually the only parameter that we have control over. Um, and in case of this all mini LM L6 V2 model, uh, word piece was, was chosen to be the algorithm for, for the tokenization. Um, it uses word or subword level tokens, which is uh, worth noting here. And if we take this original example, um, this is how this sentence is going to be split into tokens. So each word will get an individual token assigned to it. Obviously there is some conversion happening, some normalization like uh, lowercase uh, is used by default, so, so there is no difference. And actually that's true for a majority of embedding models Usually the, the, the letters are just converted to lowercase, but apparently there is a huge difference if you have a look at LLMs, because in LLMs we care about mm, uppercase, the distinguishing between uh, upper and lowercase. Uh, still, those tokens are not directly passed to the model yet. However, if we take the, the other example we had, this time it will be just converted into twice as much tokens, even though the length in in terms of, of, of uh, the number of words is not that different, it's actually identical. That's just because this um, model from sentence transformers was probably never trained on check data. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons we struggle with uh, supporting multiple languages if our tokenizer is bad. And that's also another, that's also an issue that you can see with LLMs uh, that they work pretty well for English data and then struggle with uh, some other languages. The length of that sequence also matters a lot. And the first step that a token, uh, that uh, the transformer model actually does is a lookup table, so nothing really fancy. 
because the tokenizer would produce a sequence of numerical identifiers. So each token from the vocabulary has a specific integer behind uh, that uniquely represents a given word or subword uh, in that sequence. So what the tokenizer passes to the transformer model is actually a sequence of integers. And those integers are used as indexes in the first layer of the transformer, in the first module of the transformer architecture. Because each ID has a corresponding input token embedding, which is also trainable parameter. Those embeddings are trained in the whole training pipeline of the transformer models. And then they already should capture some meaning of each individual token. Um, so we have a lookup table, nothing, uh, nothing more fancy, but that actually is already a good start because that brings some sort of understanding of each individual token in a sequence. Uh, but those input token embeddings are actually more similar to word to vec modeling because there is just a single vector per token, so there is no much understanding of the whole sequence. It's rather more a simple mapping exercise. But this is quite interesting exercise also to uh, inspect how those uh, embedding, uh, input token embeddings look like, uh, even in a very simple way. So uh, since there is like a one-to-one -one mapping between the identifier and the token embedding, we can easily visualize them because there the context doesn't matter, the token would never change. Um, and before we do that, we also need to, to, to do this uh, small distinction between the different types of tokens uh, we can encounter in that process. So our sentence transformer roughly divides the, the tokens into three groups, but we can also split them, split them more. So basically we have some special tokens like unknown, uh, which is used as a, some sort of fallback. So if we experience a character that has never been seen in the training data of the tokenizer, it should be converted into unknown token uh, just because we don't wanna break things if we just see some, some new data coming in. Uh, there are also some whole words, so obviously those are the most interesting ones because they should already have some meaning. Uh, subwords, which are marked with this uh, double hash prefix, so those are used when we encounter a word that doesn't have a specific token embedding assigned to it. So then we just cut a single word into multiple pieces and have those subword uh, level tokenization. But there are also numbers, some special characters, and a bunch of unused tokens that actually I'm not really sure about because I don't see a clear purpose of using them in, the, in this sentence transformer, but I will speak about it later on. Um, and now if we can just inspect those uh, input token embeddings, we can, act, for example, ask what are the closest embeddings to Python, for example. And as, as you may see, um, the vocabulary is fixed, so we can just compare the distances here and find those closest neighbors, and in case of Python, we can clearly see that the model itself was trained on some code, but it also didn't skip biology lessons because there is like, uh, the closest neighbors are coming from those two domains. So we have uh, like uh, double hash ango, which probably comes from Django. Uh, we have import peep and also some other some other animals as well. So it's uh, pretty interesting. Doesn't give that much uh, that much insights into the into the model and its effic effectiveness on a specific data set, but still. It's a simple idea to just check what are the uh, synonyms of a particular word and how uh, this model works in a very specific, uh, with a very specific terminology. And things get a little bit more interesting if we just uh, perform TSNI dimensionality reduction to compress every single 384 dimensional vector into two dimensional space. And if we do that, we can clearly see how those models are just grouped together. If there are any, any clusters, obviously we are just doing eyeballing, uh, which is not the best technique uh, that exists, but we just want to have some sort of intuition. We don't want to understand every single in, uh, token and its, uh, and its uh, closest neighbors. Um, and there are some interesting outcomes if you just look at the plot. 
And um, here we also used like different colors to differentiate those different groups. So we have uh, green points representing full words. We have subword tokens uh, represented with, uh, with uh, blue and, and red uh, points are just some special tokens specific to that model. And as you can already see, there are some groups uh, in we, uh, some sub areas of that plot in which majority of points belong to a specific group. For example, there is this huge cloud of, of red points at the very bottom of this, uh, of the, of this plot, but there are also some interesting uh, shapes around. So first of all, uh, those special tokens are actually some unused tokens. You need to believe me, but uh, I'm just going to like publish that as an interactive uh, visualization pretty soon. Um, and surprisingly, those unused tokens are uh, close to non-English characters. So those uh, blue, uh, blue uh, dots around those uh, red ones are actually some Japanese characters and actually lots of characters that uh, are mm, just coming from, from different languages as well. And this is quite interesting because these unused tokens have never been seen in the training data. So they are just randomly initialized and should be really far away from, from the real data uh, that we've seen during the, during the training of the model. However, uh, that this, this non-English characters may uh, indicate that, that they were just seen during the training of the tokenizer, but, but not in the training of the model. So those two processes were probably separate from each other. And I would not e expect this model to work that well for non-English data if non-English characters are just close to unused tokens in that space, because there won't be any uh, meaningful uh, representation assigned to them. Um, and if we just concentrate on some other subgroups of that, of that plot, uh, numbers are clustered with each other, so there are some Pretty, pretty interesting shapes created based on the numbers, and uh, they are like separated from the rest of the data. Um, however, there is also a specific subgroup for uh, for years, uh, and it's also good to know that those are mainly years between the 17th and the 21st century. So, if you have anything uh, before and a fact before, then they probably won't be won't be represented here. Uh, also, uh, inspecting those, those, uh, th this, this plot uh, helps to find some outliers. For example, Domesday uh, token is uh, really close to the token of 1086, which is a uh, year, and that might be a surprising fact. However, if you just try to find the reason why it could happen, Domesday is uh, a manuscript record of the great server of much of England and parts of Wales completed in 1086. So probably this Wikipedia uh, paragraph was present in the training data of this, of this model and there was no other context in, in which this particular word could have appeared. Uh, and the other nearest neighbors are uh, Neolithic, 1757 and some other years um, but uh, this time I just didn't verify the sources. Maybe there are some other uh, great service completed in these years. However, those input embeddings are just context independent. So no matter the order of the tokens in the sequence, we can just uh, perform any permutation of the input words. They will always get the same token embedding uh, as an input. So this is somehow similar to word to vec approach, which was uh, an exciting topic, but probably like 10 years ago. Uh, but we can also inspect it further. And if you just uh, ch check every single sub area of, of that chart, you can see that there is a sub area in which we have uh, people's names, uh, country names, actually in general, some proper names. Uh, and this is actually quite intuitive because if you have a sentence, the meaning of that sentence shouldn't change that much if you just swap the name of a person, unless we speak about a public figure. Uh, but that actually means that the relationship between the names was, was learned properly. And uh, that the whole process would already start with some sort of meaningful token embeddings. 
because they will capture some meaning of, of the words used and the model will then just incorporate some additional uh, information. So those input token embeddings are supposed to carry the meaning of words or subwords, uh, and they are all context-free, which is actually the reason why we could usually visu visualize it. Mm. And the next step of the, of the model is uh, our positional encodings, and those are actually capturing the order of, uh, of tokens in a sequence. Uh, that was not captured by the token embeddings because uh, they were just context-free. But here we usually use some sort of sign function in order to let the model know that the fourth token in a sequence is closer to the fifth one, 10 to the 10th. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty simple uh, way of encoding that and positional encodings are just selected a priori uh, and based on some trigonometric function and they are not trainable parameters, so they are just fixed during the whole training process. We just do this kind of projection in order to, uh, to encode that information. And what happens next is the, like a sequence of stacked modules uh, with attention mechanisms. So uh, after all these lookup tables we, uh, we used so far, our sequence of input token embeddings and reach with positional encodings uh, is now passed through this model. So, so this model uses the attention mechanism at various steps and try to find, uh, tries to find inter-token relationships. So our uh, initially context-free token embeddings uh, become uh, context-aware embeddings uh, because now we take care about the sequence itself. Mm, so ultimately, each of these modules uh, the center transformers I chose actually has six of them, but each of these modules takes a sequence of embeddings and produces a sequence of embeddings of the same size. Uh, so this is just some adaptation of the original inputs, but thanks to this attention mechanism, we now take care about the different uh, tokens in that sequence, and that is another parameter of uh, another way of understanding the meaning uh, of our data. Initially, we start with this token uh, level meaning because every, every token has a certain meaning assigned. And then the attention can also modify it to just put more emphasis on a specific, uh, on a specific uh, part of the input data. And we, the actual approach to make it even more powerful is just to stack another layer on top of it because we can easily increase the number of, of layers. If you happen to build your own model at some point, you can easily do it. And the more parameters, uh, the better uh, should be the quality of that model. And the last missing piece is actually how we take a sequence of embeddings, this time context aware, to create a single vector per uh, whole text. And this is actually a pretty simple, there are various ways of how to achieve that and the easiest and the one that is used by this particular model is just to take an average of all the uh, output embeddings it generated. Uh, this is called pooling, and as, as mentioned, there are various ways of how to do it, uh, but this one is just uh, quite commonly used. And the tokenization itself has certain problems. Uh, obviously, if we are not able to represent a single word uh, by a single token, then we need to cut it into pieces. And if you cut every single word in your sequence into multiple pieces, there will be obviously no meaning assigned to each of them. Each subword token probably occurs in multiple contexts. So obviously, similarly to word to vec there is no clear meaning for all of them. That makes a lot of sense for word level tokens, but for subword levels, we uh, subword level ones, we lose that information. So the model has to learn the relationship of the whole sequence of, of tokens inside of its parameters. So the attention has to take care of it. Mm, and a lot of issues related to the embeddings trace back to the tokenization process. If you haven't seen the, this great video by Andrew Karpathy, uh, he implemented GPT-2 tokenizer from scratch. This is a great exercise to do. And he also points out a lot of issues that, that might be uh, related to the tokenization. Uh, really encourage you to have a look. Uh, and 
for example, some of the some of the issues may arise from just a different language used in the training data compared to the to the data you would be working with. Mm, for example, there are some specific subsets of Unicode uh, that can help you to use bold or italic, italic letters on a social media platform, even though they explicitly do not allow to use that. And if you do not perform some normalization, it will be all gone because it, those uh, Unicode characters were never represented in the data. And there are more and more examples like this. Um, and also, if you use any sort of uh, proprietary uh, tool like uh, OpenAI or Cohere, you are probably paying for tokens. So you really care if your uh, data is just cut into millions of tokens every single time you pass a longer document because obviously we, we will be charged for that. And uh, we'll just go through some common uh, misunderstandings uh, when it comes to embeddings and, and tokenization. And hopefully I will also advocate for using some, uh, some uh, approaches of how to solve that. Uh, by the way, when I started using embeddings, a few years ago, I thought they are really like error proof and I was supposed to be telling that it magically, they magically solve all the problems of search, like typos and uh, the multilinguality and et cetera. But actually it turned out not to be true, and spe especially for the simpler models available out there. For example, if I would uh, like to analyze social media data, I would probably have lots of, uh, lots of uh, text using emojis, like Prague is really sunny in July, that would be probably the emotion of the original uh, writer of that message. However, if you just have a look at the tokens generated by, uh, by our model, this particular emoji is translated to unknown token just because it was not seen uh, in the training process of the tokenizer. So every single emoji will be always translated to unknown. And uh, well, that's, that's fine. If you work with uh, academic papers, you probably won't uh, ever experience this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, characters. But if you analyze Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, or any other social media platforms, actually even articles uh, in media, you can probably see a lot of this, uh, this emojis being used and they actually carry a lot of information like the sentiment of the, uh, of the person who wrote them. Uh, and unfortunately, if you just select a model that was, or tokenizer that was never uh, trained on that data, you will lose that information easily. Another thing is all about typos. Uh, if you uh, have a product that runs for multiple users, you will definitely experience a lot of typos in their queries or in the documents generated by them. Also, uh, you may struggle with, with the data quality uh, on your own. If you, let's say, have an e-commerce site and you have lots of product descriptions, you cannot avoid having some typos and errors in them. And surprisingly, if you just forget to uh, to put this additional C in the word accommodate, uh, it will be no longer uh, described by a single token, but it will be split into four separate tokens, each of them without a clear meaning at the very beginning, because obviously they occur in multiple contexts, so we never know uh, what, was the what would be the closest neighbors to each of them. And if you calculate the similarity between them, uh, this is all calculated by uh, cosine similarity, it is fairly low, uh, 0.28. This doesn't sound like similar at all. Obviously in a real world scenario, there will be some additional words used in the query. So hopefully the similarity will be a bit uh, higher, but still uh, you lose that precision just because of, of those typos not being supported. And that directly traces back to the, to the tokenizer itself. And some other typos as well. Basically, if you have real world data and you wanna use vector search, you probably have to consider some sort of query reformulation that will be just getting rid of uh, those typos, at least the most commonly uh, occurring ones. Mm. And this is quite a common uh, challenge for our users. This is quite a common uh, question that we get. Uh, well, our semantic search does not work for our use case. Uh, because we want to combine it with numerical search. 
well, if we have two shirts and they have the same price, they are similar in some way, right? But apparently it's not true for the uh, embedding models. Uh, here, a simple example, this shirt costs $55, and $55 might be just express in two different ways, possibly in multiple ways as well. Maybe you have a discount of $5 from $60, whatever. And the similarity of those sentences is, seems to be pretty high, like 0 .80, uh, 82, 83, that sounds okay. However, if we reduce the price to just 50, but use digits to represent the second, uh, the second price, it even grows to uh, up to uh, 0 0.9, which is counterintuitive, right? We just reduce the price, so they shouldn't be that similar. But if you compare the, comp the tokenization of both, the overlap of the tokens is higher for the second example because there is just a difference in a single token. Here we have two additional tokens being used. And if we increase the price even further, if, it's, uh, if it doesn't cost $55 anymore by 559, uh, the similarity of the tokenization is even higher because all the tokens present in the first example are also present in the second one, but there's just an additional one because numbers are just cut into multiple pieces. So phone numbers, product identifiers, et cetera, won't be represented at all. It's also funny to, uh, to see that if you, like, you, if you are, let's say, an electronic supplier and your users know exactly the part number they are looking for, then maybe semantic search is not for you. Uh, that also applies to dates. There are various ways of how to express dates, and definitely some normalization is required because here they are just represented in a completely different way. The set of tokens is completely different except for the, for the year, which is just cut into the same tokens. Um, and you could easily get uh, better similarity to the second example if we just swap day with the name. So, uh, 20, 24, 16, 02 would be closer uh, to 20, 24, 02, 16 than to the first representation, even though they are just valid ways of expressing dates. So that doesn't work either. And uh, the main problem is that tokenization rarely uh, captures whole numbers, especially the bigger ones. Maybe if you just have some, some small numbers or prices, you could easily uh, use one of the existing ones if it covers all the cases. Still, it won't be able to express uh, conditions like cheaper than, before certain date, etc. That just simply doesn't work and we need, need different means. And also, another problem is co uh, caused by the data cutoff. Those models were just trained at some point and they don't know their most recent facts. So if you just uh, calculate the tokenization, to create the tokenization of OpenAI ChatGPT, both are just uh, split into multiple tokens. OpenAI probably was not that famous uh, when they were just collecting the training data for that sentence transformer, or actually the tokenizer. And the similarity of both is really, really low. Um, so like, world is changing too rapidly to just capture everything and model that we trained yesterday uh, may not understand the meaning of, of some uh, new words. And that applies also to proper names. Uh, for example, the president of the US change, changes from time to time and our models are fixed, so they would never know uh, the, the best answer possible. Mm. So if you have lots of proper names in your data, then you probably need to consider some additional means and, means and uh, hybrid search or sparse search vectors based on BM25 or some, addition, uh, some other me methods might be a, a good idea. However, if you are able to perform an additional step of trying to extract these metadata filters or letting your users to, uh, to just express this additional criteria in a different way, but that's a UI problem or U UX problem, you can easily use some uh, additional attributes uh, filtering, metadata filters, uh, and those are also incorporated in modern vector databases, including Quadrant. So instead of just letting you search with the similarity uh, measures, uh, you can also provide this additional filter mechanism that might be incorporated into, the, into your semantic search. So for example, you are selling clothes and each cloth is described by the visual appearance that you can easily capture by using vectors. 
So your users will be able to use reverse image search to find a matching piece of cloth based just on the picture they took at some point. But those additional uh, criteria like price, which actually changes over time, uh, the manufacturer, fabric, etc., won't be captured at all. So that has to be expressed by payload indexes or metadata filters, actually. But payload indexes are the mechanism that you can use in Quadrant to perform that. Because if you use our search API, you can pass the vector to use for, for search to find the closest neighbors in that space. And filters actually help to uh, reduce the, uh, the search space to certain regions in which uh, your points uh, fulfill specific criteria. Uh, so pretty unique feature of Quadrant is that this is incorporated into the semantic search, so there is no need for pre or post filtering, but this is like a technical thing. As a user, you can just use the payload indexes and add this additional filters on top of it. And there is also a problem with handling non-English data, like those are all var uh, various forms of my name, and in linguistics, uh, the Klenjin is changing uh, of, a f of the form of a word, and the Klenjin shows a specific function in the sin sentence by some sort of inflection. Um, so all of that, uh, all of these are actually valid variants of my name, but if you calculate the similarity of, of, of them, it might be higher or lower, and you can never predict that just because the model was not trained on English data. And this is pretty useful to realize that the tokenizer itself might be used to estimate the quality of the embedding model in your own scenario. When you have the data you would like to encode with a specific model, and you have it obviously, <coughs> because you have a bunch of documents you want to be uh, able to search over. And there are very simple means, yet not that well documented anywhere. I was just trying to figure out if someone is doing that, but people just try to think about the embedding models as if they were just magic tools understanding the, the real language, but it's apparently not that true. Um, even a simple exercise of calculating the ratio of unknown tokens, that helps a lot to make sure that your language, your terminology, uh, your specific data set is captured well uh, by the tokenization process. And if you see that the number of unknown tokens for your data is relatively high, or there is a discrepancy between the uh, rate of unknown tokens in the documents you have and in the queries you have, then you can easily see that there's something wrong with the way you cut your text into pieces and maybe it's better to evaluate some, some other models to see whether maybe there is an alternative that we could easily use and swap the existing model. Um, and token frequency, actually I didn't mention much about how the way, uh, th about the way this uh, tokenizer was trained, but basically this is an iterative process. And after every single step of, of uh, training the tokenizer, we select a pair of tokens to merge. So this pair of tokens is thought to be the best uh, merge uh, in some way. And if we just evaluate the order of tokens in the vocabulary, we can clearly see some statistics of how the training data was distributed. So if you just perform the same training procedure for your own data and you see that it's completely different, the language does not match uh, the one you have in the tokenizer, this is also another signal that maybe you are just struggling with the tokenization and you need to rethink using a different model. Uh, and uh, that's a very simple way, a very simple way of inspecting how, uh, how a specific model will work in this non-benchmark scenario, because obviously there are some benchmarks like MTEB, which is a great, uh, great uh, idea to just check it before you select any, any model, but obviously those are all public benchmarks, so it's easily, so it's quite easy to just be on top of this benchmark because the data is publicly available, so why can't we just uh, fine tune our model so it works well in that specific uh, scenario. And tokenizer is quite often neglected in fine tuning the embedding models. I've seen many companies trying to fine tune, their mod fine -tune just their models without even touching the tokenizer, but let's say you would like to take an existing model that works well for English and then learn it to speak Czech as well. You can easily do it, but if you just split every single uh, word into multiple, multiple tokens, 
that might be not the best way of how to do it. We can easily extend an existing tokenizer. That's not a big deal. Actually, it should be included in all the fine tuning processes that we do. Uh, we can easily add a new token into an existing vocabulary and then fine tune a model so it learns this initial representation. So the initial meaning of this particular word will be kept in the model from the very beginning. So there is no need for uh, to, to learn like a, that there is a certain meaning in a sequence of tokens. Mm, and we don't really need to perform a full fine tuning process if we do that. Because if we have a model that we are just uh, satisfied with and we just want to put some additional words that uh, it could uh, understand, we can possibly just freeze all the parameters, add those new tokens into the vocabulary, and then start with some random vector from the very beginning, perform this fine tuning uh, process, and at every single iteration, our input token embedding will be just getting closer to the area of, of that space in, in which it should belong. So it will just try to find the best place for itself, but all the other tokens will be just kept intact. I mean, all the other embeddings will be just kept intact. So we'll be just modifying a small subset of the input token embeddings. And obviously, this is a very uh, simple strategy, and I couldn't really find a good name for it, and uh, this is also uh, not well documented yet, but I'm working on this. I, I would call it word injection fine tuning, because here we are just freezing all the parameters of the, of the network, so we are not training the attention at all, not, neither this feed for, forward layer that we have here, but we are also fixing the input embeddings of the, of the tokens. So we are only fine tuning those ones that we added into the vocabulary. And I did some experiments, like this all mini LM L6 V2, actually I learned the name by, by heart. Uh, uh, it doesn't understand the meaning of quadrant, like, like vector databases were introduced after uh, the model was trained. So it was just cutting that into multiple pieces, Q, double hash, uh, double hash run, and double hash T. And all of the subword tokens were, didn't have any, any specific meaning. But I was able to do this simple exercise. I just added a single token at a time, performed this word injection fine tuning, and it was able to gather some meaning that Quadrant is about some vector, Python, RAS, because this is a tool that, that is used by the developers. And apparently that improves the, the similarity in some way. This is fairly, fairly easy to be done because I just took, uh, I just scraped the documentation from our website and I just performed an unsupervised procedure. So the input embedding of Quadrant was just learned from that data and it was less than 10, uh, 10 uh, iterations of, of the training. So not a big deal to do it. You can also add multiple tokens at the same time and obviously put some additional tokens into an existing semantic space uh, defined by this input token embeddings. Obviously, if you have a model that was trained on medical data, I would not expect it, it to be able to uh, to be able to like get some tokens coming from a different domain, but still in some very simple cases like adding emojis into an existing model, that should work pre fairly well. Um, and there is still a discussion uh, going on if we really need, really need a tokenization at all. There are some architectures that hopefully will get rid of it completely, but uh, until it happens, we still need to have a closer look of, on how our texts are really represented by the model that we use. If you have any questions, I'm not sure if you have time right now, but I will be just hanging around because I really enjoyed the, the conference and this QR code points to my LinkedIn account so you can easily send me a message. Thank you very much.